Welcome everybody, I'm Dr. Steve Howe. Uh, we're here at Adventist Health Lodi Memorial Hospital in Lodi, California, and we're gonna feature the Medactosphere total knee replacement. Our first patient is a 60 year old female with a typical varus deformity. She's worn medial, she's not worn lateral on the basis of her x-ray, but if we were to show you the room here, you'd see that we don't have the x-rays up in the room because we're gonna make all our decisions about where to place the implants based on what we see inside the knee. So a typical varus knee will be worn two millimeters medial distally due to the cartilage wear, will not be worn distal lateral, and at 90 degrees of flexion, where we apply our posterior referencing guide, there's generally no wear in the cartilage there either. So I can tell you before we start the operation that our distal medial cut will be six when we measure it, our distal lateral cut will be eight when we measure it, and our two posterior cuts will be seven. And that matches the implant, which is nine millimeters thick distal and eight millimeters thick posterior, when we compensate for the thickness of the saw blade, which is one millimeter thick. So to summarize, a varus knee, typically, distal medial cut is six, distal lateral cut is eight, posterior cuts are seven. When we're within a half millimeter, even sometimes a millimeter of that, we're competent, we feel that we're comfortable enough and we will record all of these measurements on our verification check worksheet as a way to document interoperatively as we move through the operation that each step that we do is done properly. And at the end, we have a certifiable product, if you will, with the understanding that our end product is what we're looking for, which is correct. So here we are, we're seeing, here's the knee. Uh, if we look at it in terms of varus valgus, that's the varus positioning. And so you can see it open and close. So when she stands up, she falls into varus. If we go way into extension, it doesn't move quite as much because the gap in extension is rectangular, relatively tight. As soon as you flex, it becomes trapezoidal, the lateral side's looser and the medial side's looser and it moves into way a lot of varus. So, uh, we want to restore the native tight rectangular gap and a flexion gap that's trapezoidal with the lateral side wider than the medial side, but both the medial and lateral sides in flexion are looser than extension. And everybody that does arthroscopy knows this because when you put the scope in on the medial side, you can't see to the back of the knee with, an ex with the knee in extension. Once you flex a little bit and put a little valgus position on, you can see in. So you know it's a little looser on the medial side once you flex. The lateral side, you know, is white, quite a bit more loose than the medial side because when you do a scope, it's much easier to take out a lateral meniscus than a medial meniscus. So now we'll go ahead and flex the knee and uh, do our intraarticular exposure. So uh, I'm going to clear a little bit of the soft tissue off the top, Mayo scissors, and I want to create this gap between the patellar tendon and the fat pad without cutting the patellar tendon. We'll stick a right angle retractor in, extend the knee to relax the tissues, and then we'll go ahead, maybe move this back a little bit, and remove the, do a little partial synovectomy. And then we'll do a little subperiosteal dissection deep to the superficial MCL. Good, suck in the hole there, good. And uh, what I'm gonna do is I have a little curved osteotome three quarter inch. Rather than cut at this position, I'm gonna go about a centimeter down, suck in the hole again, please. And then I'm gonna lay it on the bone and just very gently use it as a periosteal elevator. And once you see it pull through like that, it lifts the superficial MCL off the tibia. And because we've left a bridge of soft tissue, then when we put our Z retractor in, it stays in the hole and does not slide up or down. And this does not change the VV laxity of the knee because we didn't strip the MCL down here. So we don't call this release, we call it part of our exposure. And this is a typical varus knee. So um, she's had a prior arthroscopy. Looks like there's been a little attempt at a microfracture with some cartilage regeneration, which unfortunately wasn't uh, done, didn't come back too well, which is typical. So before we get going, we want to excise the ACL and we're going to leave the posterior cruciate and then it's nice to get the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus out at least get a little exposure and see little of the fat pad that might be retained and then we're going to go and get rid of our 
artifice. We always widen the notch because this enables us to get the posterior retractor in the notch lateral to the PCL. And we also want to take a moment and be sure, especially with an ACL deficient knee where the notch overgrows, that we see the top of the notch. Now, we do have some cartilage retained here. This cartilage is really good, so we're going to have to correct on the medial side. So perhaps we can have a ring turret. And the ring turret is a very efficient and simple instrument for just scraping whatever cartilage is left, which isn't much, just in this sort of regrowth area down to bone. So our next verification check is we want to minimize the risk. Let's use the term minimize the risk of putting the femoral component in too much flexion. So how do we do that? Let's have a little more wider view if we can. Good. So I'm going to put my thumb at the top of the notch and my finger at the anterior cortex of the femur. So I'm going to pull that out, and that's the thickness of the femur in this region. So I want to start my drill hole midway between that, those bounds. So I'm going to put my drill on the top, and I'm going to drill perpendicular to the distal joint line. This is not going to go up the medullary canal. It's only going to go 10 centimeters into the distal metaphysis. Once I start it, I'm going to drop my hand. And then, may I have a ruler for a moment? So we would like the distance from the posterior edge of this hole to the top of the notch to be between, say, 5 and 10 millimeters. Here we are, about 8. If you start this hole down here, then you run the risk that you're going to flex the femoral component. We call this a positioning rod rather than an intermedullary rod because we want to insert this about 10 centimeters into the metaphysis, and that controls flexion extension. Now we're going to ask for the distal referencing guide, and we've made this easy. You can see this says worn and unworn. That's because we have a worn condyle and an unworn condyle. And what you'll notice, if we can show this from the side, if I can get this, this is a two millimeter buildup on the worn side. So I can rotate the guide, and I believe that you can maybe see that this area here is built up compared to this area here. So we're going to place this over the IM rod, and you notice that here there is an oval. Hmm? And that allows 22 degrees of varus valgus adjustment as well as 6 millimeters of medial lateral adjustment. So we're just going to push it down on the distal femur, and we're going to adjust its rotation parallel to the posterior collar axis, and we'll place one short compression screw in to compress it against the distal femur. There we go. If you want, you can add a second one, but we find this works pretty well. So we're going to load in three pins proximally in the zero position. And then this side drills in. It gives a good stability. We'll put that one in first. Good. The next one. And then as this one goes in, we want to remove the rod so that it doesn't get pinched by that compression screw. So we have to remove this compression screw, and now we'll do our distal resection. So I'll have my PA do it. The guides are quite reliable. Mm -hmm. Okay, stop there for a moment. Now let me have a caliper. So as I mentioned, because this is worn, we would like this measurement to be six millimeters. And uh, I'd say that it's about five and a half, which is close enough for our purposes. Uh, I might even be able to redirect the saw blade and get another half millimeter, but we'll do that in a moment. So we have five and a half, so we can write that down. Good. And we'd like this one to be 8, because the implant's 9 and we have a millimeter of kerf. And that is an 8. So I think we've achieved our goal. And by virtue of restoring the resections to equal the thickness of the implant after compensating for the wear and the kerf of the blade, 
we have restored the native distal joint line, proximal distal varus valgus. Now, let me have the saw black, and what I might try to do is see if I can get an extra half millimeter medial, and I believe that's what we're accomplishing. You can see, if I can keep my arm out of the way, there we go. So I'm going to write down on the verification check five and a half for the original resection, and the recut now makes it six. And the lateral side, we're going to write down eight. Now we're going to do posterior referencing, and we select the guide that says zero on it. So in a varus knee, rarely is there complete cartilage loss at 90. So you don't have to compensate for cartilage wear posterior medial in a varus knee in most knees. If you have a knee that's been chronically ACL deficient for a long time, and it's worn posterior medial in the tibia, then maybe you might have to compensate a little bit. Or connective tissue disorder with generalized cartilage loss. But by and large, 99% of the varus knees you do, you don't have to compensate. So we'll go ahead and put our posterior referencing guide in. So when we push, we want the thumb to compress and translate it anteriorly. So these feet are coincident to the posterior joint line. We'll drill our two positioning holes for our 401 block. And then we're going to measure the thickness of the implant, and it looks to be a three plus. So we'll take a three plus four and one cutting block and uh, tap it in position. And so I can put my finger here and I can see the slot. I know we're not going to notch. Now you'll see that we modified the guide a little bit. We actually removed the capture on either side. You don't have to do that. But for us, we're going to make our posterior cuts first. We're going to measure them. If they're not quite right, we have the ability to translate or rotate the guide before we do our anterior and chamfer cuts, and that will then allow us to fine-tune the position of the femoral component. So we're going to fix the guide just to keep it from flexing or extending with one pin, and then we're going to resect posterior medial. and posterior lateral. And when you make an error with this cut, it's usually under resected because your blade will dive or skive a little bit. And that's very easy to correct by just recutting again. Here we are, and we're going to, most of that cartilage wear is here, and we're gonna measure at this point on the top, and we can see that we've cut, in, we've cut about six and a half. If we look here, maybe there's a little cartilage missing here, maybe a millimeter, there certainly isn't any there. So six and a half actually, in this case, is probably pretty much okay. Uh, we do have maybe a half millimeter more, so I'm gonna put six and a half plus a half to get seven, and seven is what our target is, so I think we're in pretty good shape. Posterior lateral, we want this to be a seven, and that too is about a six and a half, so I can put my finger underneath, and I do have a little lip of bone so I'll get another half millimeter on both sides. Now, when we're gonna do these two additional resections for half millimeter, I'm willing to compress the guide. And so now the guide's compressed and we can make our other cuts in order. I had only taken five millimeters here and I need to move it up too. I would have removed this block and redrilled the hole, moving it up and rotated and then fixed it with these two pins and made the cut. But the posture referencing guide is quite accurate. So we're just going to take an extra half off in the back and another half here. Good. And now we'll do our anterior cut. and our chamfers. Thank you, Helen, yep. Mm -hmm. We'll take the pin out. 
And this just adds a little stability to the block, which especially in the softer bone can be of help. We'll finish our chamfer on the lateral side. Good. So somewhat soft bone, but yet we have a guide system that works effectively in the soft bone. So now, by definition, we can just check the top here and just see how we did. And uh, I have maybe, I could go down. The nice thing about the modactothermal components is they increase in size in only two millimeter increments. So if I have an implant here that is flush to the edges, I'm gonna leave it alone. If the implant's a little wide, I have room to take two millimeters more off and downsize by a half size, three plus to three. So this adjustability is something that we, that we like these finer adjustments, because we're trying to put the implant in within a tolerance of a millimeter, half millimeter. So we don't want implants that are adjustable by three or four, we want them to be adjustable by two. So we'll go ahead and expose our tibia, so we can remove those two retractors. Yep. And we'll put the posterior retractor just lateral to the PCL, because we want to preserve that right now. Let me have a rake, please, mm -hmm. and a coker. And I'm going to go ahead and just remove the posterior horn of the medial meniscus, protecting the MCL. And we'll remove our lateral meniscus. So we look at the lateral plateau as an ellipse. And we're going to draw a line. Let me have the bovie. Sometimes the marking pencil doesn't work so good, but we can use the bovie and just draw a line that bisects that ellipse and another line that goes through the eminences. And these two lines are perpendicular to the flexion extension axes in the femur and parallel to the flexion extension plane. So when we do our tibial resection, we're going to orient our guide, i.e., parallel to this, these two lines. We're going to now prepare our tibial resection. We have to adjust proximal distal. We have to adjust varus valgus. We have to adjust slope and internal external rotation. Four of the six degrees of freedom. AP and ML will do that when we use our tibial trial. So we're going to do this in order. And what we do is we use a traditional extra measure tibial guide, we apply it to the ankle, and we are going to adjust this and move the slider 12 and a half millimeters such that if we go back up to the top of the knee, we have tilted the tibial resection in about two degrees of virus. We do that for every knee. It may be off by a degree or two, but we can correct it very easily with recut guides as we will do in a later step. So we do that adjustment at the ankle for VV, and we never look at the ankle again. We're going to fine tune it by looking at the joint line. So now we'll take the top of the guide that says eight, and we're going to put that at the base of the tibial spine right here, and that will help us set proximal distal. And then we'll put an angel wing in, and the angel wing we'll use to set the slope. So I'm going to adjust the slider at the ankle and flexion extension to adjust the slope. And then I can see from the side if this angel wing is parallel to the medial slope of the medial plateau. So I'm going to restore the native slope, the native varus valgus inclination, and I want to cut enough bone off to get a 10 or 11 insert in. So now we have three degrees of freedom set, and now I'm going to set IE. So I'll put the drill in the hole, and I can use that as a joystick and adjust the slot on the top of the guide parallel to those lines that I drew, and we'll pin it. Now, I don't spend a lot of time agonizing over this step because I know I'm cutting a conservative amount of bone off the proximal tibia, and we have very good recut guides. So all of the balancing steps for a kinematically line told knee arthroplasty is adjusting proximal distal, VV, and slope of the tibia. Bone adjustments, not ligament releases. So we're going to go ahead and make our resection. And you'll notice as I saw, I'm going to saw to the back here. I'm not going to go through the PCL, and I'll saw to the back over there. And that will preserve the PCL. Good. Mark. Sponge. Good. So we can take our guide off. Uh-huh. 
I'll pull that out. Good. So now we have to look at our report. We have to look at the piece that we resect to judge whether we achieved our goals. So we'll keep the posterior cruciate. It's attached there. Clean up our bone resection. And if we look at the medial side, let me see if we can do that here. Uh, if you look at it and you look at the thickness posterior and anterior, I think that we're pretty close to the native slope. I give myself a B plus. If anything, maybe I could go another degree, but I think it's pretty parallel to the joint line because always the bone anterior is a little higher than posterior. So I think the slope's pretty good. Now we're gonna measure the thickness at the base of the spine. So we put our caliper on and I wanna get it tilted here and we're gonna measure the bet. And I am seeing that I'm measuring an eight. So that tells me what our resection is medial. Add a millimeter for the curve of the blade, you make a nine. So we probably have a sort of snug 10 insert is the way it looks. We'll go to the lateral side. This side to me looks a little bit thin and I'll go to the base of the spine, which is here and I'm measuring a seven. So our distal medial resection, this is distal medial, was 5.5 plus 0.5 for six. Our posterior medial resection was 6.5 plus 0.5 for seven. Our distal lateral resection was eight and our posterior lateral resection was seven. So here's the tibial resection and on the medial side, I believe we said that we had an eight. And the lateral side, we had a seven. So what this tells me is, I'm liable to be a little tight lateral with my spacer block in the, between the femur and tibia and extension and a little loose medial. Or I could be pretty close. But it tells me one thing, I am not going to be too tight medial. So I'm already thinking if I have a problem in the extension space where the VV, it's opening, it's gonna open on the medial side, close on the medial side, and be snug lateral. And in order to remove that, I would just do a little more of a valgus recut. And this restores the native alignment to the limb. So we always wanna make sure that we cauterize the lateral geniculates. And at this stage, we can remove our retractors, everybody out, and we're gonna put the lamina spreader in. Please uh, lift up on the femur. And we're gonna go and see what our gaps look like in flexion. So just stabilize that. Mm -hmm. So I wanna get my posterior lateral meniscus out. And we try to preserve the popliteus tendon. No reason to take that nice tendon. Good. And uh, I'll put my finger in and see if I have any osteophytes, which I don't. If I did, I would remove them. And we'll go to the medial side, lift up. And we should see that the lateral side is a bit more open under tension than the medial side. Coker? <laughs> now, we're not fans of the, con we're fans of gap balancing, but only in the extension space. In the flexion space, from a knee point of view, the knee is not a rectangular gap, it's trapezoidal. So we wanna maintain that same laxity or resting length of the ligament. So we generally want to remove uh, posterior osteophytes because they cause trouble. Their prominence can limit flexion from impingement and their prominence can tighten the posterior capsule and limit extension. We would like to remove the osteophyte that's along the posterior cruciate and we have to be very careful here but I have a little ridge of bone there from an osteophyte. I'll go ahead and just remove the PCL and you need to be careful that you remove the whole thing. Our next verification check is to check the flexion gap. So we have a nice uh, guide block here. It's 10 for flexion. So we have the flex side and the extension side. The flex side is one millimeter thinner because the implant is one millimeter thinner posteriorly. And so we're going to put this in and one of the once you do a few kinematically aligned knees you're going to put this in the flexion gap just let it relax mm -hmm. and at 90 degrees what should happen is it pivots more 
off the medial side. So the lateral side is looser and the medial side's tighter. That's the way it is in every knee and that's why we have a medial pivot femoral component because we want the medial side to stay in and the lateral side to rotate. So we have that sort of pattern of rotation there and now we're going to check an extension. So in extension we want to put the extension uh, gap a spacer block in which is 10 and this is what we call our wide open mouth view. The knee goes into full extension which is usually in kinematic alignment a few degrees of hyperextension and then we go to varus we're not opening laterally we go to valgus we're not open medially so it looks like this cut is pretty good. If for example we thought that we were too tight lateral then what would happen is that medial side would open and close and then we would recut taking a millimeter more off with a one degree valgus recut to get a little thicker plastic in here to match here but it's a miracle today we have a good first tibial cut okay so we are uh, pleased with that so now we can do our patella you can resurface the patella my preference is to do it with ka because the knees tend to be a little bit better this is not a lateral release, it's a little synovial reflection, and it just a little strip of that enables us to evert the patella and get it in a nice position for a resection. So we'll just do a resection. You can use the guide, uh, as an old fellow like me can usually do the guide, cut pretty good without it. Good. Now you can measure this uh, as well, a caliper measurement, but I find that the patella of all the measurements is the most difficult. In this case, it wouldn't have been so bad because you don't have too much wear, but a lot of times patellas are really worn. So I'll use my fingers. I think we have a nice flat cut. And uh, the nice thing about the Medacta uh, patella is it is anatomic. So we want to line this line up parallel to the quad and patellar tendon and perpendicular to the width of the patella. We'll put it into position, use our marking pen, and then we're going to drill our three holes for our button. So we'll drill our three holes, good. Those are the two medial ones, and then our lateral hole, good. And we'll then put in our three button, okay? So as I said, we have a nice uh, anatomic button. The groove is slightly medial. And one of the things we should emphasize about kinematic alignment is a mechanically designed trochlea when placed with kinematic alignment more closely restores the anatomic features of the native trochlea than when it's placed with mechanical alignment and people would think that is intuitively doesn't make any sense because the femoral component is designed to be a little externally rotated when it's designed for mechanical alignment but several studies one in our own lab and one by Charles Riviere have shown this and the reason is we believe is because when we do kinematic alignment, we do not change the Q angle. So here's a varus knee. 70% of knees we do are varus. Of that subgroup, probably half of them are constitutional varus, meaning more than three degree varus for the native limb. You take that varus limb and move it to zero or overcorrect, you have changed the Q angle, three, four, five, six degrees more valgus, which leads to patellotracking issues. We don't have that with kinematic alignment because we restore the native hip knee ankle angle the native Q angle, and the native joint lines. Hence the implant, designed for mechanical alignment, better replicates the native trochlea when it's placed with the kinematic alignment technique. And now we add a very nice anatomic button with the ridge slightly medialized, and we have a very harmonious situation for the knee. I want to show you a nice feature of the medacta tibial base plate. It's anatomic. Prior to the availability of this base plate, over the last four or five years, I've used symmetric base plates and other types of anatomic base plates, and we had a hard time knowing whether the AP axis of the base plate was aligned parallel to the flexion extension plane of the knee and perpendicular to the rotational axes in the femur. We select the largest one that fits within the cortical boundary of the tibial resection and best fit it. And then, we can draw the AP axis. And we validated this in vivo as well as in vitro in a couple of published studies. So when the AP axis of the implant is aligned to that line, then the IE is set. And it's very important we have to be careful with these knees, especially when the tubercle's way over here. 
because you're going to have a tendency to weigh externally rotate the tibial tubercle on the tibia, which is not what it's designed to do. So how does the Medacta base plate help us? It's anatomically designed. It's almost a line for line match. So you don't need this tool anymore with this base plate. You just best fit it, as we're doing here, and it's aligned to that line, and that sets the IE, the AP, and the ML because it's optimal for the tibial resection. So it makes your job as a surgeon very easy. You don't say, how am I going to set the IE of the tibial component? Just best fit the largest one within the cortical boundary of the tibial resection, and you've optimized medial lateral, anterior posterior, and internal external rotation. And what are the other degrees of freedom? We had proximal distal. We just need enough to get an insert in. Varus valgus, we adjusted so that we had no VV laxity in full extension, a tight rectangular gap, and we adjust the slope, as we'll do in a moment, to be sure that our offset is restored to native. This is a very cleverly designed reamer, because as you ream, it creates a bone plug in the distal end of the tibia, so that when you cement, the cement's not going down the shaft, and you get good pressurization. Very advantageous for fixation, and advantageous if an infection should take place and you need to pull the cement out, you don't have to go down the shaft to find it. So we'll go ahead, and what you'll see is it's easy to start, and then it gets a little harder to go at the end. Easy, now it's harder, and that is because it's compressing that bone. Here you can see this bone plug. See? It's, it's rigid, so you don't have to use a cement restrictor, and that's going to help us with our cementation and give us good sound fixation. Mm -hmm. Great. For those of you that are wary of varus tibial leucine or varus component wear, the solution to your problem is kinematic alignment. My experience now spans 12 years, over 5,000 knees. We have not seen varus loosening. What we have seen in a very small number of knees is posterior edge wear or posterior subsidence. And that's due to when we don't match the slope. If the slope is five or six degrees greater than native, the flexion space gets loose, the tibia comes forward, you bang on the back end and it looses, loosens in that direction. So the cause of, of loosening of the tibial component or wear in the tibial component is generally a bad decision in slope. We can minimize the risk of not matching the slope by looking at the medial side of the tibial resection and being sure that we didn't cut it like this with a big hunk of bone off posterior and a little piece anterior. That would be too much slope. So it's very hard to make that error if you take the time to look at the piece that you take off. So uh, we're going to now do a trial reduction and we're going to give this a trial so everybody out and lift straight up if you can. Mm -hmm. One second. And this is a good sign. If you notice, she can't get the tibia to go behind the femur. If it goes by easily, then generally the flexion gap's too loose. So I'm going to extend the knee a little bit now lift up on the femur, and now it goes around easily. Good. So we'll go ahead and put our femoral trial on. Uh-huh. We're good? So we have a nice fit. And when we do have a little medial lateral mismatch, which you can on occasion, we want to make sure that, if anything, it's a little lateralized, okay? We'll take the drill. Good. So once again, we're going to do our verification check. And this can be a little difficult to show just because the angle has to be just so. But we're going to look at the gapping now between the tibial insert and the femoral component, medial lateral, and extension. So I'm going to have to get my head in the way for just a moment and look. And I don't want any play, which I can tell you I don't. Now the sphere insert and the sphere femoral component has ball socket conformity. So it's very stable AP. It's also very stable in VV. So we have to double check about our laxity by flexing about 30 degrees to let the ligaments relax so we can see how much the lateral side opens. The medial won't open much because the trapezoidal gap is always larger lateral than the medial. We flex a little bit and I can see and my lateral side is opening about two or three millimeters and that's what we'd like to see. 
if this side opened five or six, then it may be we didn't cut enough varus. And we would recheck this and maybe have to cut another degree or two off. So now we're gonna check the laxity in flexion. Go ahead and flex it up. And so the patella should track like it did with the no thumbs technique. So in the flexion gap, we wanna see if there is any posterior translation of the implant on the femur. And you see, this is why the sphere works without the posterior cruciate. It's sort of a ball and socket one-to-one -one match. If the gap here was a little big, I'd use a thicker insert, but I don't see that. So I'm pretty pleased with this. And then we wanna check IE. And we need to have about 15 degrees either way. And I think we're in pretty good shape. Let's just get our final check for laxity. We're gonna flex the knee a little bit and see how difficult or easy it is to move out, remove the tibial insert. So this comes out quite easily. Hmm? We might be able to go back up one size. So, good. And we check, make sure it goes straight. We're lacking a little extension. Now that could be a little capsular contracture, a very gentle maneuver. That took care of it. So there's a little posterior capsular contracture. That's a plastic deformation. It's gonna not recur. So we're pleased with the extension. Let's flex it up. And here we have, I think, a little bitter resistance to posterior. We still have a rotation and it's pivoting more about the medial side than the last case. And we don't have to worry about the patella tracking. Why? Q angle restored native joint lines restored, the axis in the femur about which the tibia flexes and extends, the axis in the femur about which the patella flexes and extends are parallel to the joint lines, restoring the ligament lengths, and the IE axis in the tibia about which it rotates on the femur is also perpendicular to the joint line. We have a harmonious situation, should be an easy recovery, less pain, and the patient get back to activities quickly. So we have to uh, resect a little groove for the uh, trochlea of the femoral component. And we'll go ahead and just push this in. You can pin it if you want, but it has a nice tight snug fit due to our Swiss engineers. And uh, we'll just go ahead and cut the groove here now with the router. Mm -hmm. Good, and you just want to run it back and forth like that until there's no abutment. So that looks real good, thank you. Van Preet, and we'll go ahead and we'll put a little bone graft in here because we don't want uh, a lot of cement going up the canal in case there is a problem with an infection, which is really uncommon now that we have all of our nice soaps that we give the patient for five days of scrubbing in the nose and the mouth and the body and our perioperative antibiotics. And so we're, we're, we're quite pleased that infection has become a bit of a less of, a, of an issue. So we'll go ahead and just pack some bone in the hole. Okay, come on out. So now uh, we have a very nice uh, bone plug hole and we can put our cement in and it will not go down the tibia and forms a buttress as we take a moment and impact in the tibial base plate. And that's why I prefer a cruciate stem. A rectangular or I-beam stem I find is very unreliable and undesirable because when the tibial component it goes in, it can change its rotation and we spend a considerable amount of time setting the rotation correct. So how do we know it's correct? Because we validated this with post-op axial CTs in large numbers of patients, thousands of patients, and they, the paper is reported now in the knee journal as well as uh, Clinical Orthopedics of North America. The nice thing about this tibial insert, you just insert it and push it down. We don't need a locking bar that can disengage. We don't need a apparatus to push it in, just locks in place. So once again, I think we have a little trouble getting it around the back until we lift the femur up. And again, if this thing just flies around with no difficulty in flexion, it usually means your flexion gap is excessive. And of course, it's too late. That's why we like this calipered technique, calipered kinematic alignment, where we've calipered all the bone resections to be sure that we've done it as we go.
nice tight fit good Swiss engineering Good, good. So just make sure you have your two buttons. Uh, two, two buttons are going to go in the medial side, and then you can get this engaged. Because we did a VMO uh, split or approach, we have the vastus medialis still centering the patella a bit for us, and we just, just hardly ever see a tracking issue unless the patient was a chronic dislocator, uh, and then sometimes you will see that. We rarely do a lateral release. I do about 550 primaries a year. If I do a lateral release once a year, that's probably it. So the patella should just stay in position. We go back, and if we look at 90, which is where we're sitting, we have plenty of IE, and I think that we have a knee that should be one that feels pretty good to the patient with an easy recovery, not a lot of stiffness, uh, and feels uh, a little more uh, like a normal knee to her than maybe uh, when things were put in uh, with our, in my own experience, with mechanical alignment. So with, uh, with kinematic alignment, there's a lot of things that we've noticed. Uh, I've been doing this consistently, without exception, since 2006. It's 2018, 12 years. Somewhere over 5,000 consecutive primary total knee replacements. All comers, we do not limit the selection of patients based on preoperative deformity, and nor do we limit the degree of correction. We want to do the, achieve the goals we emphasize today, make sure that the distal and posterior resections of the femur match that of the implant and restore the native joint line, make sure that in full extension the VV play of the knee is negligible, like the native knee, and make sure at 90 degrees that we have the proper offset of the tibia on the femur and IE of about 15 degrees and those are our verification checks. We find that rehab wise these patients are usually up and walking this afternoon and I think we'll be able to video that for you. They usually have 85 90 degrees of flexion post-op and aesthetically I think it's your choice but we prefer at the present time general anesthetic because these procedures are usually around 45 minutes so they're quick uh, we do not give any blocks. We do put a cocktail in the knee. We like to uh, give them 50, 30 milligrams of Toradol pre-op as an analgesic. And then we put an injection in the knee consisting of about 40 cc's of Marcane half percent with Epi. We don't use the uh, long acting uh, version. We just use standard inexpensive Marcane half percent with Epi. We add to that uh, 30 milligrams of Toradol and we add to that a gram of transemic acid. So those three uh, components are injected in the knee and we save about 10, 15 cc's for a ring block. Uh, these patients are generally quite comfortable. Uh, as I mentioned, they walk well. 95% leave the next morning, so it's well suited for outpatient. In fact, all of our patients, according to Medicare criteria, are routinely set as an outpatient uh, for uh, the hospital stay and discharge. We usually see them back at about six weeks uh, in terms of assessing their function. They have their staples out at two. And at six weeks, their average Oxford score is 32 out of 48. Their average score pre-op is 20. During that six weeks, we have a very, let's have a bolster. We'll put this under the knee. During that six weeks, we tell them the rehab is simple. Every hour they're awake, we want them to get up and do a short walk for a few minutes, putter around the house, kitchen, bathroom, front yard, backyard. Uh, we tell them to come back and sit down for a couple minutes and practice straight and bending the knee. And then we want them back into bed and we want the leg propped up on a bolster like this. And then at six weeks, they're all generally riding, driving the car and getting around, off their walker, back to activity. And patients with bilateral arthritis every week, because we do about 14 primaries a week. On average, two patients out of the group will be seen back and they'll say, sign me up for the other knee. So we can do the other knee with a quick turnaround and get them done within three or four months. And therefore, there's not a lot of office visits because the recovery is so predictable and easy that you don't have unhappy patients coming back and uh, 
and uh, making your day difficult because you don't want unhappy patients, you want successful happy patients that keeps you busy and makes you sleep well at night.